Welcome everybody. And uh, it is indeed a pleasure for me to participate in this 2021 Neobiotech webinar event. The topic of my discussion today will be specific to bone and sinus augmentation trends and techniques. And as you know, I am uh, from Atlanta, Georgia here in the US. I uh, work with a team of specialists um, that have been practicing together for the past 30 plus years in a multidisciplinary practice with an in-house laboratory. So the opportunity for us to work side by side has been uh, really effective and allows us to do um, the type of dentistry that um, we can be proud of, but also, also to teach and be able to share um, the, uh, the type of material that we collect and the type of cases that we perform with a group of specialists in one location. So I'm going to attempt to share that with you today. What you see on the right screen is uh, the most recent iteration of Team Atlanta with several new young um, specialists in oral surgery, periodontics, and prosthetics. Also, uh, many of you may know that uh, we are also participate and have been part of the number one online dental education website, www.dentalxp.com, which is now in its 13th year. And uh, certainly welcome many of you uh, to take a look at this website, to share in this community with over 220,000 dentists worldwide. One of the aspects of this website is to take small blips of uh, content and techniques and new materials that are available in aesthetic, restorative, and implant dentistry and provide that material to the members and the community uh, through these short 15 to 15 minute to one hour presentations that go into and delve into very specific aspects of implant, surgery, prosthetic, and aesthetic dentistry. So I certainly hope you'll take the opportunity again of joining us on the website. Current implant concepts and technologies really is a great marriage of what we are as clinicians from the educational aspect, the biological aspect, and wound healing aspect of dentistry, but also on the other hand, it's a marriage with new concepts and technologies that become available. And certainly for me and my, uh, my relationship with Neobiotech over the last decade and a half has been the introduction of really um, tremendous new technologies that has enhanced my implant practice, namely um, the sinus lift kits that have been made available that you will see shortly. Um, the any check devices, the implant devices, and certainly the implant removal tools that have been made available amongst many others. But we as dentists are focusing predominantly on the aspects of really taking this and being able to utilize it on a daily basis on the full arch patients that are dental handicaps, patients with either trauma, disease, or genetic deficiencies. And this young man that you see here um, is suffering from ectodermal dysplasia, a genetic or congenital deformity where many of his permanent teeth have not formed. So what we want to do first is have a thorough diagnosis. So we want to evaluate the case. We want to see the mobility of the teeth. We want to see the occlusion. We want to make sure that we make an assessment from an orthodontic and facial standpoint. And we take lateral cephalometric films, cone beam CTs, panoramic films, assessing all aspects of this congenital disorder. And as you can clearly see here, we have a patient with a class three skeletal malocclusion, mid-face deficiency. And we want to be able to identify certain aspects from the facial standpoint, from a lateral cephalometric standpoint. And you can see here a very classic uh, orthodontic uh, measurement of facial position. This is the SNA line. And you can see that we have a um, over-rotated mandible and a deficient maxilla as part of this congenital deformity. 
planning of the case will also take into account just the, the ability for us to locate the areas that will acquire grafting, mainly the posterior maxilla and the mandibular anterior region, as well as the numbers of permanent teeth that are missing and the ones that will be left behind. Diagnostic study models. Of course, today uh, we have to consider the fact that even with digital uh, technology, we still uh, 3D print models, we mount models, and even though more and more of this is being done digitally, uh, analog is certainly still available to many clinicians. And whether it's digital or analog, a diagnostic wax up at a proposed vertical dimension is critical. Digital dentistry, certainly here, our office now currently is fully digital, taking advantage of this. Um, so what we wanna do is basically in a simplified form, take a pre-op model, digitally design where the teeth are going to be in three dimensions, uh, perform the wax up digitally, or if you'd like, through analog means, and then create a mock-up. And that mock-up will then be inserted into the mouth for the patient to have an evaluation process. And very often these, uh, these mock-ups are spot bonded so the patient can live with them for a few days as a test drive of their future uh, restoration. Much of this concept uh, was created uh, initially in Atlanta with Christian Coachman when he was part of our team uh, for several years and now is part of a separate organization, DSD and DSD Laboratories run by Christian Coachman. And he certainly deserves all the credit. Uh, it was a wonderful opportunity for us to uh, uh, cr be creative and innovative with Christian during his time with Team Atlanta. The wax up as a proposed treatment plan is going to establish the width of the maxilla, a opening of the vertical dimension to uh, counter rotate the mandible and to achieve better facial aesthetics and lower lip support. Once the patient accepts the, uh, the mock-up and the treatment plan assessment based upon the digital wax up, we are then gonna go in and do this digitally guided. You can see a fully guided solution here. We're going to do sinus augmentation. A lateral access here is being performed and at the same time using the retained permanent dentition to support the surgical guide during the placement of implants. Now, accessing the lateral sinus today for me uh, is quite simply a much easier, more efficient, and more predictable procedure because of the utilization of the Neobiotech SCA and SCL kits. Um, being able to access the sinus with these neurosurgical burrs, uh, being able to do them quickly, and being able to do that without tearing of the Schneiderian membrane. The augmentation of the floor of the sinus, obviously, when we look at this from a biological standpoint and looking at it from a scientific research standpoint, we know that we have three choices. We can utilize nothing at all, simply allow for blood clot to stabilize uh, and wait for bone formation to occur, um, using the implant as a tent pole for the Schneiderian membrane to maintain the space. But most often, many of us are using bioactive materials uh, PRF, PRGF, maybe CGF, uh, BMP2s, uh, many different types of growth factors that are now available, both autologous and recombinant in nature, or, and a form of particulate bone. And many people are using different types of particulate bone or a mixture of particulate bone and a bioactive substance. For me, I typically like to use a mixture of two and three. I find that I get better bone formation, faster bone formation, and I'm able to load my restorations more quickly. So if we take a look at uh, the type of cases that we're doing today, here's a small video. All of these videos I'm gonna share with you are on Dental XP with voiceover, but accessing the sinus through a full thickness flap, vertical incision, and then being able to access the sinus through the SLA burrs and SLA kit from Neobiotech. This is the drill uh, going at roughly uh, 1500 RPM. And you can see in a live video unedited that my access into the sinus takes mo most often less than a minute uh, with these burrs. And the burrs basically push bone dust in front of, or bone powder in front of the drill, protecting 
the Schneiderian membrane. So you have the ability of um, drilling through bone and then uh, not having any issues as it has a stopper and does not tear through the Schneiderian membrane. You'll also notice small blood vessels running through the outside portion of the Schneiderian membrane. This lateral maxillary blood vessel uh, is very often can be cut with typical drills. Uh, here using the SLA uh, drills uh, and using piezo uh, devices as you've just seen, allows us to avoid that complication and hitting the blood vessel. We're now gonna use hand instrumentation. A lot of times these are where we do tear the sinus is during instrumentation. And uh, I'll often utilize another technology such as balloon elevation. So where we lift the, the re remaining parts of the Schneiderian membrane with a balloon filled with saline. And we push this balloon in to gain complete lift of the Schneiderian membrane without having uh, to utilize instruments uh, all the way around. So this is a very slow methodical uh, opening and lifting of the Schneiderian membrane all the way to the medial wall and posterior walls of the sinus access. So we fill the balloon up and then we remove the saline from the balloon. And you'll see here the bellows effect of the Schneiderian membrane as the patient is breathing in and out, the sinus will reflect back and forth. Only at this time will we utilize the bioactive materials. Here we're going to use a mixture, as I said before, I like to first use fibrin to protect the Schneiderian membrane and its sticky nature will allow it to stick to the surrounding bony walls. And I will introduce sticky bone, a mixture of the PRGF here and the particulated um, bone graft material. So this is sort of a standard for me today. And I think it is, uh, again, it's facilitated by technology and this trend of quick access, safe access without tearing of the membrane, uh, the Schneiderian membrane, and then making sure that we place a collagen membrane to prevent soft tissue invasion of the lateral access. So we just stabilize this with a few screws. This is a cross-link collagen barrier placed before closure. And we can then place some more fibrin and then close as you see here. So here we're doing everything all in one visit. We're trying to minimize the amount of surgery through these trends and technologies, flap access, lateral access, the Schneiderian membrane, placement of the implants, fully guided and really small access, not a large access for the window utilizing the uh, SLA drills. So here's the maxilla, day of surgery. We're doing this uh, in posterior areas on the left and right sides. And phase one is now completed. Early healing, you'll see this is very typical when you're accessing the sinus in this manner. We can do this all as a one stage procedure with healing abutments being placed. And then we, we can move our attention to the mandible. Again, you can see how in these uh, ectodermal cases, the deciduous teeth are resorbing at a significant rate. They become very mobile. And now we can use the remaining permanent teeth to support the fully guided option in the mandible. And the implants are placed incisionlessly here. But we still left with a bony defect in the anterior mandible. And we're going to treat this with autologous bone. So the flap is raised the same day. You can access the uh, the ramus buccal shelf, as you see clearly here in this, uh, in this image, this is a very good harvest site. It's a fairly low morbidity, unlike the chin area. And we can perform these procedures utilizing a piezoelectric device to cut very thin cuts in the bone very safely, does not cut soft tissue, does not cut blood vessels, and we can make very fine cuts in the bone so that we can then use chisels and out fracture the bone in this manner. So here's a quick, again, quick video of us utilizing this technique. It uh, can be utilized in a fairly effective small incision here, just from the distal, the bicuspid, uh, second bicuspid, all the way to the retromolar space. The cuts can be made very quickly using this piezoelectric device based on a cone beam CT. And then we can chisel out the bone as you see here. 
Once the bone is taken, a gel phone, a hemostatic dressing is placed into the donor site and very simple nylon sutures are then separated and placed in position. We can also use the uh, Neobiotech ACM drills, which I believe one of my favorite drills for bone harvest, so that we can harvest in two manners. Autologous bone is still very, very important. We have vital cells. And here you can see in real time, very quickly being able to harvest bone safely in this auto chip maker. And um, although there's been many others that have tried to duplicate this particular technology, I still believe that the Neobiotech, the original um, device created by Dr. Heo, to me is still uh, the best one I've ever uh, utilized for this particular indication. We can then mix this bone with an autologous bloodborne bioactive material here. This is PRF. And we're gonna create sticky bone made out of autologous bone. We can also harvest ca uh, cortical bone chips from the ramus buccal shelf. And you can see here the difference in the color of the bone. This is more cortical where there's the previous harvest was more cancellous bone. So a mixture of 50-50 here, getting a half a gram each time. So now we have a one gram mixture of cortical cancellous autologous bone mixed with the patient's own bloodborne bioactive material. So fully autologous bone can be managed in this fashion. Sticky bone being made in this way. So the ACM drill for me is a, absolutely a necessity. Today's uh, implant surgeon, I would be uh, uh, more, it, to me, more often than not, I'm using the six, seven, and eight millimeter diameter ACM drills. I, I prefer wider diameter so I can harvest in just a few, few times. And what's nice about these drills is they, uh, they can be used in multiple sites and multiple spaces and they last maybe four or five times before you have to start um, changing them and getting a new one. If you're going to be using them too much, they start to uh, be used too often at high speed, which they shouldn't be. So if you're gonna be using the ACM drills, remember again, the plastic sleeve cannot be placed in a sterilization unit. It has to be cold sterile and the metal can be placed in an autoclave. Also remember that you're going to be using these drills at low RPM. It's very important that if you're going to be using them, as you saw in the video, that you're using them at low RPM. Typically, I'm, I use them between 150 and 250 RPM um, and not anything above that. If you get too high on your RPM, you're going to end up killing a lot of the vital cells and the, uh, the graft will not be as biologically sound. We then secure the bone blocks in the anterior mandible in the same patient. And now in phase one and phase two, we've utilized different technologies, sinus lifts, uh, utilizing ACM drills, uh, bone harvest with piezo and using ACM drills in the mandible for a fully autologous graft in these areas. And then of course, digitally fully guided implant placement. Now we can go back to the laboratory based upon the digital smile design mock-up. We are now going to transition this patient from the temporary restoration to the final restoration using a combination of remaining permanent teeth with veneers and crowns. And we're going to be utilizing the implants that were placed at phase one. If we take a look at this from a facial standpoint, the pretreatment with the bite opening on the left side, so we can get better lower facial height and change the lip support and the profile of the face. In the middle slide, you see the implants at the original VDO, you can see how we have a concavity of the face. And then when we open the VDO on the right, you can see a completely different soft tissue profile a very nice straight Cupid's bow, straight cephalometric lip support, beautiful here, and a very straight profile, not concave as you see in the middle screen. And here the patient after final restoration has been placed, a fully functional and aesthetic restoration utilizing the, uh, all the aspects of modern uh, biology and technology in implant dentistry.
the actual phase treatment plan that took place, you'll see on the left screen before, uh, during the, the bone augmentation and the implants then placed in the bone graft on the right screen. And now you see the pre-op on the left screen. This is the original panoramic film and then the actual treatment plan with all the implants placed in all the bone graft sites. And you can see again here, the before on the left, the provisional restoration based on the digital mock-up in the middle, and then the final restoration now two years post-op on the right screen. This patient is now uh, 10 years after treatment, still holding up very well with his grafting. Severe periodontal disease causes significant uh, three-dimensional defects, both horizontal and vertical in nature, some of the most challenging types of cases that we treat, because by the time the disease has caused the mobility of the teeth, we've lost vertical and horizontal bone around the alveolar process. So the question always becomes, should we be minimally invasive? And my, my answer to that is, whenever possible, you should always attempt to be minimally invasive, but you should be maximally predictable. So if minimally invasive does not make you maximally predictable, then I often avoid the minimally evasive process. So in a case like this, where the periodontally diseased teeth were removed because of mobility and bone loss, you can see that we have substantial lingual bone loss, which is maybe even more challenging in the mandible because of its location to the genioglossus attachments and the anatomy in the floor of the mouth. But we also have vertical bone loss and interproximal bone loss. Uh, that we see here in this case. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna once again, because of the technology available, being able to access the ramus buccal shelf. That doesn't mean the retromolar space or the ascending ramus, but just the ramus buccal shelf on many patients is a very common source of efficient and predictable bone harvest of at least on average three millimeters of cortical bone from this space uh, with a low morbidity. Today, we can take these plates, uh, these, these blocks, and we can cut them with a disc and create bone plates. Unlike the last case, which was done a decade ago, where I'd use the entire block of bone as a traditional block graft, today we're taking this bone and we're splitting it into two plates rather than as one block. And then what we can do is use a bone scraper to scrape these plates into very thin plates, making them pre predominantly about millimeter or even slightly less than a millimeter in thickness and harvesting all that bone autogenously in those bone scrapers for the, for the bone graft in between the plates. We're gonna use a bone clamp to stabilize one of these plates on the lingual and one of these plates on the buckle. And then we were going to place small diameter, 0.9 millimeter Meisinger screws from the buckle to the lingual to stabilize the, the plates on both sides. So here's where we started in the pre-op. This is the day of surgery, recreating legitimately the lingual plate and the buckle plate utilizing autologous bone plates of approximately a millimeter in thickness. Using the autogenous bone harvested from the autogenous bone scrapers, and mixing that with a bloodborne bioactive material. PTFE sutures for tension free closure. And then what I call necessary invasiveness. If we're trying to rebuild an alveolar ridge that has been damaged from trauma or disease, to me, this is probably the best form of three-dimensional bone augmentation, a utilization of plates and autogenous bone with growth factors. At three months, you can see that the plates have remained. We have good uh, healing of the soft tissues and a maintained closed healing environment. I can't say enough about how critical flap management, the ability to release flaps, the ability to close flaps and maintain a closed healing environment is because once we have wound dehiscence or opening of the suture line, <clears throat> these cases can become uh, quite a complication uh, for management and we can lose most, if not all, 
of the intended result. We can now plan our implants uh, being placed into the grafted area at about five months. We then go ahead and now we can be minimally invasive. We can do this guided. And since we placed our fixation screws in the area where we weren't placing implants, we can leave those fixation screws in, minimizing our flap dissection and placing our implants. Now, another technology that I think is outstanding is the implant stability test or IST, any check system. What I like about it is it's easy to use. We don't need special pegs. And especially in grafted sites, it's very important that before the restorative phase that we feel comfortable in assessing the stability of the implant. We don't wanna to be too early in restoring these implants before they're completely osseointegrated. So the AnyCheck, is a device that can be used on any implant, healing abutment, impression coping, uh, analog, whatever connects to the implant rigidly, it can give us a measurement that assesses the stability of the implant. And it is very, very similar to other measurements that have been uh, uh, talked about in the past, such as ISQ. So here are the implants placed into the grafted site. You can see the Meisinger screws have been left behind and there's no reason to remove them since they're not in the path of the implants. Now, if you're looking at the reliability of verification of this new technology with AnyCheck, a recent publication just a few months ago in the International Journal of Oral Maxillofacial Implants has professed this as the conclusion at their in their conclusion that within the limits of this in vitro study, implant stability was measured by a dampening capacity assessment and was suitable for the investigation and the extent of implant micromotions. I think that this has been very effective for us in our practice. We have two of them and we utilize it routinely the day of surgery, after healing, and then after temporization before final impression is taken. We assess those measurements and are able to see the improvement of stability very often from the first day all the way to the final restoration. So here's a case that we treated with zygomatic implants. And before we load such a case, we wanna make sure that these implants are stable. So uh, here in our office, we're using an OptorGate to reflect the lips and we're going to take the measurements on the multi-units without having to remove them, which is very nice and it speeds up our ability to assess the stability. And here's my partner, Marco Tadros, Dr. Tadros of Prostodonis, using the AnyCheck on this patient to assess the stability of the zygomatic implants. So here he's checking, he's got a seven, uh, an 87 on one of them. This is 80, 87 again on the posterior. This is a quad zygoma case. And it's very important to get the right angle when using the AnyCheck device. If you don't have a good angle, an acute angle, it will tell you that there's an error and you just have to reposition. So here's 78 on one of them, 87 and 78 on the last one. So those readings are very similar to the standard ISQ readings that you've seen before. And there is a chart that you, will, that you can get from uh, Neobiotech that will tell you how to compare IST numbers to ISQ numbers because it's also based on the height of your prosthetic uh, connection, whether it's a healing abutment, impression coping, or if it is a multi-unit abutment as you just saw. So how do you measure stability? In the past, we've been given Ostel Mentor, Periotest, and now AnyCheck. The advantage of AnyCheck for me is significant. There's no need to remove the healing abutments, uh, especially in these multi-unit full arch cases that can, be, that can take a long time. And every time you remove and attach a prosthetic component, we all know that it tears the junction epithelium and it could cause at least some minor bone resorption around the top of the implants. There's no need to connect the smart peg. There's no additional cost for having smart pegs, especially if you have a number of different implant systems that you're using. 
You can contact to the healing abutment. You can also take a stability testing of a tooth. A lot of times we like to see how our teeth are doing. If we're splinting them, we're not gonna splint them. We wanna assess stability, not only of implants. So this is a great device for assessing the stability of teeth. There's a strong cor correlation with I ITV values. And I believe, as I've said before, they're very predictable. So when we're looking at modern techniques at bone augmentation, as you've just seen modern techniques with sinus augmentation, I think that for me, I have moved away from using blocks, uh, which I used probably for my first 15 or 20 years in practice. And over the last decade or so, I've been using uh, the Quarry technique, autologous plates, uh, as I just showed you, uh, splitting the block, scraping the bone from the blocks and using them almost like membranes in a box technique. Uh, some people use an additional plate over the top. Um, I prefer to utilize a, um, a collagen barrier, non-cross-linked over the top just to get closure in between plates. You can also utilize GBR techniques, uh, sausage techniques, whatever you want to utilize. That's also a technique that can be used for significant deficiencies. Uh, I'd like to mix in large three-dimensional defects, some autogenous chips, so I would still use ACM drills to mix with uh, whatever bone graft substitute you are going to be using with it. It's always good to get some autogenous bone uh, in a three-dimensional defect, even if you're using xenograft, allograft, or synthetic bone particles. Ridge splitting, still a technique that is very viable, uh, being able to use interpositional grafting rather than utilizing uh, extra alveolar grafting or on-leg grafting. If you look at ridge splitting, I kind of see it as a pedicle plate technique because you're kind of just separating the plates uh, from each other and then grafting between the plates, very similar to what we do with uh, autogenous plate techniques. We also using tie mesh, and very important to get the right kind of tie mesh. Uh, what you're seeing here is the utilization of uh, tie mesh from the Neobiotech GBR kits uh, with small pore sizes for blood and, and the growth factors and cells to be able to access the graft material. And then of course we can use allograft blocks, but for me, allograft blocks are my least common technique to use. Although more recently there's been the advent of mixing these blocks, infusing them with growth factors and doing this all through 3D printing. Uh, so that may be something in the future, as you see here on a stereolithographic model, um, a bone block, allographic block that was, uh, was just 3D printed from a plan that we had made and infused with a BMP2. Often people are confused about the timing of healing in regenerative dentistry, and I, I want to make some things perfectly clear. The most efficient and fastest way to grow bone for me, and I think in the literature would be autogenous blocks and plates. Typically we're waiting a, a period of about four months because this bone is very active and, and re resorbs and replaces very quickly. GBR, guided bone regeneration, typically six months, maybe even longer in a very severe uh, type three, three-dimensional defect. Ridge splitting and expansion, I typically wait six to eight months. And if I'm using BMP2 and tie mesh or allogenic blocks with BMP2, I'm typically waiting the longest because this bone needs more time to turn over. The bone is softer with low Hounsfield units in the beginning. It's not fully calcified early on. I like to wait about eight to 10 months in, in, this, in these types of situations. So there's a very big difference between survival osteointegration and aesthetics. So survival for us is the ability for the implants and the case to survive. Osteointegration being a biological term. And then of course, aesthetics has to incorporate the soft tissue and the, uh, the design of the restoration, the contour of the restoration and the emergence profile of the abutments. So we're gonna look at that in terms of some of the failing dentistry we sometimes are, are faced to deal with, a patient with a failing implant, 
uh, in the posterior maxilla, a previous sinus graft that had failed. And we have a fracture of a press fit implant and a very narrow posterior maxilla, which is a very common finding we often have a narrowing of the ridge at the same time that we have pneumatization of the sinus. So by the time we remove the implant and looking at this on the CT scan before removal, you'll see that we already knew we had a very large pneumatized sinus with minimal remaining cre uh, uh, crestal bone to support an implant. And here's the implant that is fractured, needs to be replaced. And we're gonna be placing an implant in, in what appears to be mostly uh, air in the sinus. So we have to obviously have a very, very uh, profound bone augmentation in the sinus. And at the same time, we also have a narrow ridge. So we have to do a combination of GBR and sinus augmentation. With a press fit implant, some of the counter torque removal kits don't work very effectively. So we typically are forced to use trefine removal, which causes an even greater defect. And we wanna avoid complications. So we don't wanna tear the sinus membrane, whether it's a crestal technique or a lateral technique in the sinus, you don't wanna tear the Schneiderian membrane. Large tears and pushing of bone through those tears are what causes significant and severe complications. So if we're going to go ahead and proceed in these cases, very often what I like to do is if I can access the sinus through a crestal approach, I obviously prefer to do so. And one of the ways to do that after we raise our flap in a patient like this is the ability to do this with the SCA kit, the sinus crestal approach kit from Neobiotech. So you have a very nice system of neurosurgical burrs that turn at high speed. And you'll see this after I clean off. I wanna make sure you can see here, I wanna remove any soft tissue that's remaining. And now I'm gonna go in with the Neo Biotech Crestal Sinus Approach Kit. What you're seeing here is on my handpiece is a depth stop. I know that my sinus begins at about three millimeters. So right now I don't wanna tear the sinus. So I wanna put a stopper that doesn't let my drill access the sinus immediately. So I wanna go about a millimeter before the sinus floor and then to the sinus floor and then only then all the way through. So we're gonna go in with the crestal approach and we're gonna keep checking. As we approach it, we're gonna to go to the next depth and we're gonna go with the diamond drill and we just walk it up. Many times I'll use the two, then the three, then the four millimeter stops so I never penetrate very, very rapidly into the sinus. And these drills, again, push bone powder or bone dust in front of them to protect the Schneiderian membrane. So even if you feel a small give, you're more than likely not going to tear the Schneiderian membrane, which is very critical as through a crestal approach is almost impossible to, for us to repair it. So we're walking the drills up using this technique and then once I get to the final drill, this is now a four millimeters, I'm going in and I can feel a give. And when I feel the give, only then will I go and I access the sinus. So here you can see the sinus from the crestal approach after the last drill, I'm just checking the depth or we can always go if you wanted and use the lateral approach kit. So you have two options with this technology, a lateral approach or crestal approach. Here we access the sinus. We're going to use a collagen barrier inside the sinus mixed with PRF. And then here we're going to use BMP2. We're gonna use collagen sponges and BMP2 mixed together. And you can see here in inside the sinus is a clear septum that we needed to avoid. So it's very important if you're gonna access the sinus. So we're gonna use this technology to grow bone in the sinus and in the defect that you've just seen on the extracted implant. And this was shown in a study by Dennis Tarnow, Stephen Wallace out of NYU uh, about uh, eight or nine years ago, maxillary sinus augmentation utilizing recombinant bone morphogenic protein too. So we're gonna mix this acellular collagen sponge 
with BMP2, plus we're gonna use 50-50 mix of particulated bone, cortical and cancellous mixture. We're going to tack the membrane here and build out the narrow ridge of the alveolus, and then we're gonna coronally advance our flap. At eight months at re-entry, notice the difference between the before and the after. The only thing left behind are the pins that stabilized our long-term cross-link collagen barrier. Collagen is no longer there, it is resorbed, but you can see the lateral window is now full of bone and the implant removal site is now also completely full of bone. So I wait longer with BMP2, but I get profound bone regeneration as well. So it is a very useful tool in regenerative protocol. I can now place my four implants into augmented bone where the sinus was, and then we place additional low turnover bone product and a little bit of acellular dermal material to thicken the tissue before our closure. So again, taking every opportunity to grow bone or to alter the tissue thickness, either at the time of grafting, the time of implant placement, and then very importantly, uncovering the case. Because when we do coronal advancement of the flap, we alter the mucogingival junction, we distort it. So now the mucogingival junction is all the way at the crest of the ridge. So we don't wanna make a simple crestal incision or we would remove all of the keratinized gingiva. We don't wanna use a tissue punch in this indication or we will remove the keratinized gingiva. So the same way that we use a coronal advanced flap, we now wanna use an apically repositioned flap to move the keratinized tissue and reestablish the mucogingival junction. So here we open the flap. We see clearly that we have great robust healing around our implant sites. Now we want to make sure not only did we build out the ridge buccolingually, not only did we take care of the extraction of the implant site and the, the uh, sinus augmentation, we also now want to take care of the tissue. So the tissue is very important. Everybody always hears us talk about the tissue as the issue. So we're going to now apically reposition the keratinized gingiva on the vertical incision. And now we have another problem. If we move the tissue from the palate to the buckle, we're gonna be left with three areas that are completely exposed into proximally between our healing abutments. And what we're going to use here are three rotated palatal pedicle grafts. This is a Palachi grafts. Patrick Palachi first wrote about this over 20 years ago. We're gonna rotate these pedicles in between the implant sites to protect that bone. And they're just small rotational, full thickness, uh, palatal pedicle grafts. We can use this in a very, very easy technique uh, to utilize to place tissue in between the implants. And we're now going to use a linear split thickness palatal release to bring the tissue up on the um, palatal aspect of the healing abutments. And then we suture and leave that split thickness area to granulate in. This is now six weeks at impression taking. You can now see 360 degrees of healthy, pink, vibrant, keratinized tissue around the implants that were all placed in a deficient, three-dimensionally de deficient ridge. Now the lab has an opportunity to assist us in tissue molding, sculpting the tissue with emergence profile. We talked about survivability. We talked about predictability, osseointegration, and aesthetics. This case shows it all because our ability to place the implants directly down the long axis based upon our bone regeneration, tissue is available now to be molded and shaped, and we can even end up with a scallop and interproximal tissue fill. Very healthy four unit restoration in a previously deficient posterior maxilla with excellent soft tissue quality and quantity. This is now several years later. You can see very, very good post-op healing and implant to bone contact. Minimally invasive techniques are also available and internal crestal approaches to me are a big part of my practice today. And I'm gonna talk about that now because it can make these kinds of cases very, very simple. 
So here's a patient with fractured molar with the roots still remaining. We don't have to wait to be able to do these cases now. We can do them quite uh, efficiently. We're going to extract the root tips and root fragments utilizing um, luxators, periotomes, whatever you'd like. Very important to get some diamond tip extractors as you see here to grab these root tips very effectively. Um, that's probably uh, one of the best instruments that I've uh, come across. And that way we now have a very nice site to work with. And now rather than wait to do the sinus augmentation later, we do it the day of extraction. And we do that using the S reamer. This is from the uh, S, um, SCS, SCA kit, the uh, sinus crestal approach kit. Again, neobiotech te technology from Dr. Heo. And you can see what it does with the stopper. It prevents you from puncturing the Schneiderian membrane as you enter the floor of the sinus. So if you're looking at it here, as that drill is going towards the Schneiderian membrane, it pushes the bone dust in front of the drill, protecting the Schneiderian membrane from puncture. So a very, very important technique. We're gonna go ahead, in this case, we're gonna use the uh, the IS kit from Neobiotech. I know this is version one. I know this probably, uh, and this is an older version of the kit. And certainly I'm sure there are newer ones available today. And we're gonna go and place our implant at the same time as we do our sinus augmentation. So here we're using the uh, Neo CMI implant, the IS2 active. One of the things I love about it, if you see the picture on the right, uh, I'm taking it out of the kit and I'm applying the uh, PRF, the uh, bloodborne bioactive material. And you can see that the, the implant is very hydrophilic. It's friendly to liquid. So it grabs onto the blood clot, it grabs onto blood, it grabs onto the bioactive materials. And we now can place the implant and a healing abutment because we also get extremely good torque insertion with these implant threads. Healing abutment is tapered, but not immediately. So it comes up and then comes out, which is better. Doesn't bind down to bone around the, uh, the implant sites. And especially today, as more people are placing implants subcrestally, it's very important that your healing abutments are shaped in this manner. The CMI fixation, if you look at the implant itself, you can understand why it has excellent uh, implant stability at the time of placement. We add bone density in the CMI fixation. The threads are all different. We have a rounded top, so it doesn't puncture the Schneiderian membrane, but then we have very aggressive drills. And then over to the top, we have crestal fixation uh, threads. Middle fixation, and then the inferior fixation. More cutting at the apex. The middle is for fixation and the crestal does not put the same amount of pressure on that crestal bone, so we don't have bone resorption or dieback. So really an excellent technology here uh, for this implant design and uh, certainly think that it works quite well. D2, D4, and D2 bone. I can now grab my sticky bone matrix, place it around the healing abutment. And once again, the implant design is really made for self-compaction. So you get very good stability without compression of that crestal bone which is very important. It's tapered, it's narrow, but it has a strong apex. And as I mentioned before, good threads and it tapers to a rounded apex. So here's the pre-op and the post-op utilizing the bone graft into the sinus access through the crest. And another, again, I, I keep looking at technologies, but another technology that has been so important for me is treatment of periimplantitis. A patient with an implant a central incisor doesn't want to lose the implant, doesn't want to go through a myriad of different procedures to re-graft this area. So what we do is we take off the restoration, we place on this, um, this brush, the titanium brush for periimplantitis that forms around the top of this attachment to the implant and cleans the implant threads from any um, soft granulations materials. So the R-brush from Neobiotech, very, very useful technology 
uh, for the treatment of periimplantitis. I always suggest if there's a crown on or healing abutment, remove the crown, remove the healing abutment, go back down to the implant level. You will screw on this adapter that protects the, the head of the implant, and then the R brush fits directly over that in an implant motor at very low RPM. You're not doing this at high RPM and it removes any of the debris around the implant that has been infected. Now, after you do this, I would still suggest that you treat the implant with tetracycline for three minutes, irrigate with sterile water, and then also utilize an NDAG laser for detoxification. And uh, that's just 80 joules of uh, laser energy at about five millimeter distance, and that should detoxify the implant and prepare it for bone augmentation. So here's the tetracycline placed on the implant after the R brush has been utilized. We're going to now utilize a Neobiotech um, titanium mesh system, which is very, very, uh, again, very creative, very innovative by Dr. Heo, where we can screw the titanium mesh and fixate it, not with screws or pins, but by securing it to the implant itself. So now we can screw the mesh onto the implant through a cover screw or through the utilization of spacers. And this is not just for the Neobiotech system, it can be utilized for other systems as well. So the CTI mesh being used, you can see it here, we have spacers. And then on top of the spacer, we have a screw that goes into the spacer and stabilizes the mesh and we place our bone graft underneath it. The advantages are significant. We don't need pins or screws. It's time saving, it's less exposure problems and very easily removed. So here I'm placing my bone graft underneath the mesh, flipping the mesh down. Now, some people like to have the mesh at the bottom completely seated. So if you wanted to, you could place a pin or a screw at the bottom. Uh, I do this sometimes in these cases, and then I place fibrin um, and sticky bone in combination. Here's a plasma rich in growth factors or PRGF, which was created by Dr. Eduardo Anitwa. And I close with PTFE sutures. The middle x-ray is the day of surgery. The right x-ray is several months later, and you can start to see cortical bone filling in the area under the mesh. And here, when we remove the mesh at approximately six months, look at how robust the bone augmentation has been. This technology, it really works. There's nothing more to say about what you're looking at in this, in this image is profound bone augmentation about, around a previously infected implant site. And that's all that was necessary to do it. Here's the pre-op on the left, and the post-op on the right. Pre-op, and again, from the occlusal view, and you can see significantly about four or five millimeters of buccal bone and, and a almost root prominence over the implant site now that's available. So when we're starting to look at cases, again, I like to always preface it by saying it depends on the complexities and the persons and the individuals that are working on it. When we have these types of class two problems, type two defects, don't try to get away with it with narrow implants or mini implants. Deal with the defect with augmentation, build the bone, build the tissue, and then place your implants. There are restorative implications of non-regenerative approaches. And this is a non-regenerative approach. And this is a young patient in her twenties. Look at the deficiency in the ridge, even after implant placement with mini implants. To me, this is a failure. One implant has fractured, the other one is inflamed. The patient doesn't like the aesthetics, again, in her 20s. So we're going to remove these mini implants and we're left with the defect. And here, the problem with these mini implants is we need to use trefine drills to remove them. So fractured mini implants are removed. Very often, if I don't have a mini implant, one of the best removal tools on the market is a, the Neobiotech removal tool. Removal, it has a system for implant removal. This is the Neobiotech removal system. Uh, there are many others, it's very effective. It has a screw that goes into the implant and then it has the gold cylinder that goes over 
the removal screw, and then we torque it out at very high torque, over 200 plus Newton centimeters. So this Neobiotech fixture removal kit, very effective. And you can see here on the right screen, here's the kit in the middle screen. And on the far right, you can see how that looks when the implant is removed. So when you've had some bone loss, the implant is no longer salvageable or has been slated with a prognosis of failed and you want to remove it from the remaining bone, you put in the removal screw and depends on the diameter of the implant system you're using. It is universal. The system can be used for any implant system and it comes in different sizes for narrow standard and wide diameter. We torque down the removal screw as you saw there and then we counter torque. The removal screw goes in at uh, 35 to 50 Newton centimeters and then the removal tool is then placed on the ratchet and the ratchet removes the implants at roughly 250 Newton centimeters. And the implant will actually deintegrate. You can go up to 300. If it doesn't work, you can even go up to 350. And then the implant is removed. So again, a very novel technology and tool for the implant practice. Now I can go ahead, once again, do what I've talked about before, ramus shelf bone harvest, the placement of the bone grafts in position. Here I'm not using plates. This was an older case utilizing blocks, two-point fixation, using the 50-50 mixture of autogenous bone with growth factors and ACM drills, always part of harvest the fibrin over the top of the bone grafts and then primary closure during the healing phase. Very, very important process. It must be maintained throughout the healing phase, but I wait typically with autogenous bone blocks or plates four months. And then when we come back, you can see this robust healing, excellent bone, very minimal bone resorption, and we can place our implants into position always trying to augment the soft tissue. So at the time of implant placement, I'm going to add acellular dermal tissue to thicken the tissue so that we have more tissue for the restorative phase and for tissue sculpting with the restoration. Implants in place for three months, we open it up, we place our um, custom abutments, Look at the tissue volume. The ridge concavity is now a convexity. And then when the patient smiles, look at the papilla formation right at the same height as the central incisor papillas and a very happy patient with beautiful, permanent, predictable, and long-term restoration. So I would like to take the opportunity to thank Neobiotech for inviting me today to speak with you. I hope that it has been informative. I hope that I've shared some of my new concepts related to sinus and bone augmentation related to implants. I also hope that you've had an opportunity to see some of the very creative uh, tools, technologies that have come out of Neobiotech that have assisted me in my dental practice for the last decade. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Hio because he uh, really is the inventor of almost all of these products that you've seen. And I'm still a user uh, of those products. They're outstanding. And um, I uh, look forward to some of the Q&A um, during the, the question and answer period. Thank you very, very much for your attention.